And we're going to get started so we can get in, get out, and get on with life. Do you have a um, million dollar candy bar? No, million no, dollar. They should make million dollars. That would be for you. Oh, I would make one. I'm going to invent no. that candy bar. One be eating apple. Yeah, <laughs> right. I'll make ten of those. Anyway, um, this is a uh, one I did for dining, and it's, I'm doing it for you, and it's also going to be done in the chapel, if you know anybody who missed this, um, next month. So am I in your way? Should I stand somewhere else? Okay. Yeah, this is a, Hi, April. This isn't working. Okay. Okay. Dementia. We all we talked about this a lot of times. Dementia. What is it? It's a chemical change in the brain as well as a structural change. So the brain literally changes, the chemical transmitters aren't getting from cell to cell. So the brain is changing. The brain actually shrinks as brain cells die. So as the brain cells are dying and going away, your brain is literally shrinking. We don't know if that hurts, we don't know if they can feel anything, but we do know that the brain is shrinking. And there are less neurotransmitters going from cell to cell and these are chemicals that help us with our memory. So that's how cells talk to each other, by the neurotransmitters. That's the stuff that like um, Aricep, the chemical, the meds that are given to people with dementia. Some days are good and some days are bad. Some days there's more confusion and more frustration for people going through dementia and Alzheimer's disease. And again, dementia is not a mental illness. I've heard that for the last 30 years that people think it's a mental illness and it's not. It's the brain is literally dying. So, so these are the most common dimensions that we see. Um, Alzheimer's disease, which is the number one still out there, and it's got a gradual decline in cognition and memory. It's a very slow, steady decline. And it could go from three to 20 years. So someone could have it for three years and someone could have it for 20 years. I can't even imagine 20 years being Every day. Yeah, I have a question. What's the deal? What the difference? How come some can be bleeding and some can be longer? Some people get dementia or Alzheimer's disease early in their life. So if you get it when you're in your 60s or if you get it in your 30s, which has happened, it's rare, it goes faster. The disease itself goes faster. So if you get it in your late 60s, 70s, it tends to run a longer course. And can we have it on the You could. Possibly, you, you, you would blow it off as there's nothing wrong with me. I think most of us would. Um, vascular dementia is the second uh, type of dementia that we see a lot of, and we're seeing a lot more of it. And it is more the person who's had the multiple strokes, the vascular um, uh, vascular muscles of the brain, where the blood just that pops, the, the vein pops, and the blood is bleeding. You have a, like a brain, a bullet, a brain bleed. Um, so it's more of a stair-step decline. The difference between vascular dementia and Alzheimer's disease is the people with vascular dementia have a better articulation. They can articulate their words and their vocabulary a lot better than those with Alzheimer's disease. Theirs tends to be a little more um, muddy and made up and garbled. Lewy body disease, the most misdiagnosed dementia out there, is kind of a mix of Parkinson's and um, uh, Alzheimer's disease, where they have the rigidity of Parkinson's, but then they also have the memory loss of Alzheimer's disease. It's kind of like getting a double whammy. Um, and again, it also has a lot of hallucinations with it, delusions, poor gait, they're a little more unsteady on their feet, and they often lean to one side. We had a few people who had Lewy bodies and they did walk a lot, um, leaning all the time. Uh, frontal lobe dementia, this is the most challenging type of dementia there is. There's over 18 different kinds of frontal lobe dementia. And because there's so many different kinds, it's kind of hard to know what it is. But people with frontal lobe dementia, it's more of uh, the drug abuse, the alcohol abuse, where those brain cells are literally dying away. And so the person could be really fine. For example, someone with alcohol-induced dementia, they've been a lifelong drinker. They've done a really good job, but when they get in there, they're mid-60s, they can't quite do that job anymore. So, but they, they're perfect from here down, but their brain cells are fried because of all the alcohol. 
and all the alcohol poisoning in their system. Mm -hmm. So if they become a little more agitated, uh, a lot more hard to redirect, a lot better approaches need to be tried because they don't they don't believe what you say. Um, it's really challenging to work with someone with a frontal lobe dementia. With all dementia we, that we see, um, in the meeting all of us might interact with the person with dementia. We need to know how to interact. We want to interact with them correctly, but we may do it right and we may do it wrong, not intentionally. We want to make that connection. It's one more piece of the puzzle that will help them be better interacting with their world. So um, we want to also interact in a way that doesn't cause an issue. And we don't do that intentionally. We don't wake up in the morning and say, oh, Mrs. Smith, boy, I'm going to tick her off today if I can. I mean, we don't do that. So it's totally, it's totally off the cuff if someone gets angry with you because they misinterpreted what you said. Unfortunately, we do sometimes get it right, but purely by accident. Or excuse me, don't get it right, but it's usually accidental. The person with dementia can't change, ever. They're on a steady path of decline, especially with someone with Alzheimer's disease. They can't wake up in the morning and take a pill and say, I'm better, because there's currently no cure for dementia, Alzheimer's disease. And so the people um, who have it live each day as if it's a new day. Um, so we have to learn how to interact with them, and we have to be the ones to learn how to connect, because they can't do that. We often might ask or say to ourselves, oh gosh, they know what they're doing. They're doing this on purpose. They're just doing it to upset me. And I've heard families say that, and it's not true. They, they, they don't wake up in the morning and go, oh, Mary Jones is working today. Let me see how many buttons I can push. I mean, they can't, they can't plan out their day anymore. It's totally spontaneous. Um, so with dementia, they can no longer think like that or plan out their day or coordinate those thoughts to make that happen. So there are some basic things we should do and not do. The more we interact, the better we get at it. And the more we know, the better our approach will be. So knowing the people you interact with, knowing the people with dementia will truly help how you interact. So this is what a brain looks like normally. We all hope our brain looks like the one on the left. The one on the right, the Alzheimer's brain, is that's the brain that is shrinking. And that there's big holes where the brain cells have died and there's no connection. So there are those big holes and those big caverns in the brain. The brain cells are dying with the disease of dementia. The brain literally shrinks. Abilities that were strong and once prominent um, are now gone. And the experience is different for everyone. Not everyone is exactly the same as they go through the process. It's totally different. So in your memory, memory is the first thing to go. Um, forgetting what happened yesterday and sometimes forgetting what happened five minutes ago. Um, but for all of us, as we get older, even in our 30s, our memory starts to decline in our late 20s. It's just normal, that's how it happens. And where the busier we get, the easier it is to forget something. And it doesn't mean you're automatically going to get dementia, it just means that you're really busy and your head is so full of information that sometimes something drops off. So memory is really, really important. But that's the first thing we all see with our loved ones and the people we take care of is that they forget. They forget. Um, one of the things is I was talking to someone today who was in their 90s. And I was asking them, so how old are you now? Oh, I'm 72. And I know what's going on. So they were, they, that person was back, you know, 30, 40, 70, 20 years. So, um, they truly believed that they were 72. They had no thought about being 90. So the next time, um, so when you, why can this be a challenge if somebody doesn't remember um, five minutes ago? With dining. What'd you say? So they just ate a meal and they come back for another one? Because. They, they, did, they didn't know they ate. And then if you tell them they ate, what might they say? You're lying. You're lying. I didn't eat. We had someone who ate three breakfasts every day because he'd get up and eat and leave. Come back and say, I'm here for breakfast. We'd give him a little bit less. <laughs> and he'd come back, leave, and he'd come back again for a third time because I didn't eat. He did put on a lot of weight. Um, and also for dining, when someone is getting their... Um, 
They're order taken and they order something and then it comes out. I didn't order that. Why would I order that? But yes, you did. You ordered it. So we're having this argument with them, which, you know what? We gotta take we gotta let it go and say, okay, I'm so sorry. My mistake. What would you like? But sometimes what happens is it's that timing of getting it from here to here to back. We want to get it there quicker so that they um, have that idea that they're not waiting too long for their food. Uh, forgetting important dates, asking the same information over and over and over again is very common. Taking longer to do things. And early on in the disease process, there's sticky notes everywhere because that's their way of, this is going to help me, this is going to help me, remind me. So the people use a lot of sticky notes. Um, forgetting to pay their bills or paying them more than once because they forgot. Grandchildren getting birthday cards two and three times for the same birthday because grandma and grandpa forgot and they just mailed it. That may be a clue that um, something might be going on. Understanding what we are saying. So learning and understanding starts in the hippocampus part of the brain. So everything you take in today that you get from this or from me goes into your hippocampus and then is transformed into a long-term memory somewhere, into a file. Got these files in your brain. And so this is the area that covers 10,000 connections with other neurons. The hippocampus is really small, but it's really, really important. That is the first part of the brain to die. Those brain cells die first. So when things are going into people's brains, it's going right through the optic nerve, back to the brain, into the hippocampus, not the optic nerve, excuse me, back to the hippocampus, and it's not going anywhere because the hippocampus is dying. Folks can still hear so <clears throat> sounds. They can hear what we're saying. They may not understand what we're saying. They may misinterpret what we're saying because they may not hear it correctly because of their hearing loss, or when it gets in here, the process isn't right, and they can't, they can't build the connection. Um, we, need, we need to not use slang language. So when we're having a conversation with somebody, if we want to say, let's go jump in the tub, it's time. Whoa, jump in a tub. Why would I want to jump in a tub? So we have to use the words that they're going to understand, like it's time to take a shower. And sometimes what might help is having everything ready or that, you know, the nice whirlpool. Some people, women usually love the whirlpool. Do you guys have trouble with getting people into the whirlpool? No? That's awesome. Uh, we have to set up the room ahead of time and say, let's go for a walk. So when we get to the bathhouse, which is what we call it, we get in there and say, oh, look, your stuff's here. Oh, you might as well get your bath in now before everybody else gets in. We have to do a lot of sometimes therapeutic fibbing to get people into that bath or that shower. Um, sometimes it works, and sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes people say, ah, there's no way I'm getting into that shower. There's no way I'm getting into that tub, and they bolt. And what do we do? Nothing. We let it go because we're not going to start a fight over taking a bath or a shower. There's always two hours from now, there's always the next day. So we kind of have to learn our approach in people like that. We have to make sure that we know how they might react so that we can always do the right thing. Speaking, um, and this starts out early on in the disease process, like you just heard me earlier, mumbling my words. Um, but people will um, look at you and they will pretend they know you. They will put on this big mask like they know what's going on. Oh yeah, hi, how are you? Oh, how's the family? Great, how's your kids? wonderful. They have no idea who you are, truly. And if you spent 24 hours with them, you would figure that out. But on the surface, they speak very globally so that, um, so that you don't pick up on there's something wrong with them. We have a village full of people doing that all the time because I don't want anybody to find out that something's wrong with me. I might be put in one of those places like Lydia's house. So they speak really, really globally, and if they can't find the right word, and this happens to us um, in our 50s, 60s, but with, more so with dementia, is, you know, that thing you sit at, you know, you know, that thing, you have that, it's got legs on it, you know, it sits, it is square. They can't find the word table up here in their memory bank, so they describe that. Hopes that we figure it out that they're trying to say table. So they describe a lot of the words they're trying to think of. Um, sometimes we see word salad, 
where they have a whole mismatch of words just muddy together. And we have to try to figure out which one of those words are, we can, we, that we can latch on to and try to figure out what they're trying to communicate to us. A lot of times it's, uh-huh, yep, I understand, I got it, because we have no idea what they're trying to say. And if we put a frown on our face, and just kind of like, you know, squinch it up our, our nose and our face like, oh, no, they're going to pick up on that nonverbal cue and it can go sour. So we just try to be a more happy, but if someone is very sad and they're trying to communicate something, um, a lot of times we just have to, we have to look at that and not be happy because again, if we're being happy when they're sad, again, it could go the wrong way. So um, vague or mixed up language or made up language, sometimes people make up words and make up a language that you have no idea what they're saying. We had one lady that used the words fine as frog hair for everything she did her whole day. How was your lunch? Fine as frog hair. Do you need to go to the restroom? Fine as frog hair. Everything she said, that's what she would say. Um, and then there's single phrases like that. It was just a very short phrase. And sometimes women who were very strong Christians in their life will go through the disease process and the only words they have are swear words. That's all they will say. And that's because on the right side of our brain and the left side of our brain, they do different things for us. So we lose information on the left side of our brain and we retain information on the right side of our brain. So for language and speaking, singing is the last thing that people will lose. They may learn, forget how to say words and speak, but they will remember how to sing and have rhythm and to always to the end of the disease process. They can sing songs up until the end. It's, it's really in their long-term memory banks if they have um, had any, even if they, especially more if they've had musical background, they can sing amazing things up until the end of life. Um, and swear words are also in that category on the right side of their brain that they retain. So, and they can remember little ditties and little, um, uh, little rhythmic uh, stories. They usually tend to stay as well, but all they, you know, the stuff that we do, uh, the sequencing, like getting dressed in the right order, that's on the left side of our brain. Those are the things that get lost. So, approach is everything. So, think about the best customer service you've ever had in your entire life. Think about where that was. Was it in a restaurant? restaurant? Was it at Les Schwab? Was it in a department store? Was it at the doctor's or the dentist's office? Where was it? Anybody can think of the best customer service they ever had? Anybody? Home Depot. Home Depot? You had good customer service at Home Depot? That's awesome. Hertz Hartcraft. Where? Hertz Hartcraft. Hertz, okay. <laughs> Mine was at Subaru dealership. It was the best customer service. They are awesome over there. Um, how about the, and how did that make you feel when it was good customer service? Really good. Like you, want to go back. you want to go back. Every time I go to Les Schwab, they run out to your car. I love that. I will always buy my tires at Les Schwab. Always. You want um, that person to take care of you. Yeah, you want that person to take care of you because they made you feel important. So, um, how about bad customer service? What was the worst customer service you ever had? Where's the list? Where's the list? <laughs> Well, I can tell Apple you, bee. huh? Applebee's. Applebee's was bad. Okay. Um, I bought a watch not too long ago, and it broke within two weeks. I tried to get it fixed. Poor customer service. Absolutely, I waited five hours to see somebody to look at my watch. Um, poor customer service. I even wrote a letter. Um, I have not heard anything back yet. But it was unfortunate. I mean, I just really hate that watch, and of course, I'm not even wearing it. But um, it just, it's, poor customer service makes you not want to be a part of that organization. Does it make you want to go back to that store or go back to that restaurant? I mean, we want to, so what our approach is, good customer service. That's what approach is. Approach is just good customer service to our residents. So we need to listen better so we can respond better. We may hear one thing and it could mean something totally different. We have to figure out what are they trying to communicate to us. People remember the feelings of a bad experience longer than the feelings of a good experience. 
If something, somebody has said something mean to you, boy, it sticks in your craw for a long time. But we tend to not remember the good things that happened to us for very long. So we try to make their whole day full of snippets of good things so that they have a longer period of time. People with dementia truly believe what they believe. Truly. Um, Lydia's house has been called a brothel before, and that person truly believes, and of course it came from a woman, that all the women there working are taking care of all these men, and it's a brothel, and by golly, this is a horrible place. I mean, and I've been there 20 years, and I have heard that a few times. Um, so they truly believe that, and just saying it's not doesn't necessarily work. Um, so we try to have to figure out what they're trying to do, what they're trying to say, and how do we, how do we match it for um, their experience. Um, the people with dementia truly believe what they believe. If we disagree with them or tell them they are wrong, what could happen? They get mad. They get up. You could have a. You could get slapped or punched or hit or an argument could ensue. So we have to be really careful. Things. Um, it's not intentional. So interventions we use and the challenges that we might see. Approach is everything. How you talk, how you act, and what you know. So the more you know about somebody, the more history you know about a resident the better your interaction will be, the better the connection will be, and the better your approach will work. And the more therapeutic fibbing you can learn to use, because you're going to match what they believe works. So if I would have told this 72-year-old person that they were really 94, I would have had a fight in my hands because, uh, excuse me, I'm not 94, I'm 72. They are started on their decline going backwards, which is what happens to people with Alzheimer's disease. It's a steady decline of going backwards in the life cycle up here. Um, so we want to be a part of their current world, whatever that is, and try to mimic and match what's going on with them. Let them be where they are in the disease process. We can't change them to come forward to 2018. They're not in 2018. They're wherever their mind says they are. So we want to be there. We want to go slow, establish their routine, and limit their choices. But we also want to give them at least two choices for breakfast or lunch or dinner or um, getting dressed in the morning. So if I was here and somebody brought me oatmeal every single day because that's my favorite, I didn't have any participation in my daily routine of choosing what I wanted for breakfast. Even if I chose oatmeal every single day, I didn't get an opportunity to choose. So you want to give them an opportunity to participate in their day, unless they said, excuse me, don't you know me? I've been here for 10 years, I want oatmeal every day. That's a little different. But people need the opportunity to be a part of their day. So we want to work on pain management. If someone has way out of control pain, then there's a problem that they might be lashing out for just because they have pain and they can't tell you. What is the worst pain you ever have had? Or you did? Huh? Toothache. It's the worst. It's my worst pain because you can't fix it real quick. So if someone's got a toothache, they may not be able to tell you, I've got a toothache and I'm in horrible pain. They may only be able to respond with uh, a verbal abuse or meanness or antagonistic, and you're like, wow, what's wrong with this person? It could be maybe there's some pain that we can't, we've got to figure out where it's coming from. Redirect somebody or reapproach to avoid confrontation. Uh, confrontation is when you are right in front of them, this far away. People don't, that's a very confrontational kind of stance. We want to approach somebody from way back here first. But we also want to reapproach. If they say, no, get out of here, I don't want to talk to you, you need to leave. And maybe somebody else has to swoop in and be the savior. Um, we want to use ice cream, ice cream, and more ice cream. is kind of like the magic food. And you can make it a big deal if someone's really having a bad day. You can make Make them feel like they are the only one in the whole wide world who knows this secret. I know where they hide the ice cream. I found out, and you know what? I'm going to go down and get you some. Would you like some chocolate syrup on it? Make them feel super special. Ice cream goes a long way for getting people into the tub, getting people dressed, getting people into the toilet. I mean, it's amazing the benefits and how it can work in your favor. Ice cream, is, and it's smooth, it's soft, goes down easy, people don't normally normally choke on it. It's awesome. Just make sure they're not diabetic first. Make sure they're not diabetic. They do make carb-free ice cream. Yep. 
So scheduled toileting, some people need that just because they won't have accidents then. Um, and one of the things we're not going to tell people is, excuse me, you need to get out of that bed because you'll wet it and I need to change it. We don't want to do that to residents either. So what we have done in the past also is our, our approach is we did have a lady uh, live at Lydia's house who had this big uh, double bed and in the morning normally it would be wet. And so instead of going in, waking her up and getting her out of that bed because it was wet, which means she was wet, we would go in, staff would go in and go, hi. You know, they would kind of get on the bed near her and tell her, like, guess what? The kids were here. And she loved children, so we knew that. Uh, and they brought squirt guns. And they got every one of us wet. And they got your bed wet, too. The kids were here, and they got everybody wet. So it is it okay if I help you get up and we get this wet bed changed? And usually that would work 90% of the time because she connected with kids and kids playing and kids having squirt guns and it worked. Um, so had we did it something differently, it probably would not have worked very well. Um, timeout, and the timeout is not as a punishment, it's a timeout where someone is going to a place that is going to bring them more comfort as opposed to this room full of people and all the noise and hubbub going on. They need to have a quiet space. So maybe in their room with their favorite music going might be something that would work for them to get out of all this limelight of all the hubbub. Um, evaluate the environment and remove triggers, things that make people upset. So you guys just have a piano in here. Anyway, if someone was in here playing the piano and it really bothered that person, maybe that person doesn't come to that piano um, time when that person is here playing. Something that is making that person angry, we need to figure out what that is and how do we get rid of it. Activities, you guys have Rhonda here who can do um, activities, but how do we create activities that will promote people to feel good about themselves, to improve their self-esteem, um, and keep them active, and they have to be adult-like. Just because they are 50 years in the past, so now they're in their 20s, sometimes they're even in their they're 10 years old again, and we're going to give them something. It better be adult-like because these are still adults that are going backward in the life cycle. It's, it's a ba gentle balance. And so they've made all these wonderful adult coloring books, but with aging eyes, a lot of our residents can't see some of those intricate patterns. So it's something we have to constantly look at. I use family all the time when I want someone to be less distressed than they are. I will say, you know what? got an amazing daughter oh my gosh she is done and I don't say how old she is depends I'm trying to feel out what's going on your daughter is awesome she was able to get you a spot here for the weekend oh your family is amazing a lot of times they just use family um, as opposed to daughter if, if I'm not sure that her daughter is old or young but if her daughter is young I'll often say I've met your daughter she is wonderful you were such a good mom you raised her so well and a lot of times, they, you can just see women just beating. Just, just rise up because that's one thing that mothers long to hear over and over and over and over is your kids are amazing. And so even when they're older, you can talk about their kids and how amazing they are. And sometimes they will contradict you like, are you kidding me, that bum? I mean, whatever they're thinking. So we have to really kind of jump into their world, be a part of it. Um, the more you argue, the more you're going to get what you deserve. If you argue with somebody about maybe they've got on um, your sweater, they saw the sweater hanging on the back of a chair, they put it on, it's nice, and you went to get your sweater away from them, and, they, and you said, oh, can I have my sweater? It's my sweater. What do you mean your sweater? And the more you argue back and forth, and you get hit, they get angry, Oh, and you get smacked, you deserve it. You almost got to let that go and you'll get your sweater later because in their mind, this is mine, I just found it and I'm going to wear it because I'm cold. And you can do creative things like if you see someone with three sweaters on, you know, I'm freezing, I am so cold, oh, I'm so cold, can I borrow one of your sweaters? And they might do that to get a sweater off of them. So you got to get creative with all those approaches. Therapeutic fibbing works 90% of the time. Um, and it's just, again, it's matching them where they are and making up that story that works for them. It's kind of like that um, getting your kids to eat green beans when they were little. They didn't like green beans. 
How do you get them to? How did you get them to eat green beans? It's having that magic trick in your pocket uh, to pull out that card so that they would do what you wanted them to do. It is all about the end result with therapeutic fibbing. We had someone who kind of decided to go outside for a walk one day, and so we were. I was following, walking with him because there was no way he was going back in. And we were walking and walking and walking and he wanted to go home and um, that wasn't going to work. And so we kind of, I tried to walk and steer him into the back gate of Lydia's house and I had somebody unlock it so we could go in. I said, oh, we're going to go into the secret garden. It's really cool back here. Let's go check it out. And I was able to get him into the backyard of Lydia's house and eventually back inside. But it took a couple hours of just walking and being very patient. Again, every approach is going to be different for every different person. Do not startle a resident. Do not come up behind them and start talking because people will jump and that gets their heart rate up going and um, could get them um, kind of off kilter and be a little more sensitive, a little more testy. Um, always approach slowly and from the front. Make eye contact first before you approach and, some, and just say, hey, it's Mary. How are you? I did kind of approach slowly. Um, use a soothing tone. Don't be talking too fast. Don't be uh, talking too loud or screechy. We want to have a soft voice when we're working with our residents, but we also want to be able that they can hear us. So for people who are, do not hear well. Um, do not touch a physically aggressive resident, someone who's really angry. You're not going to want to get in their face and try to have a conversation with them. You might want to steer them away to a safer area with maybe ice cream, but get them away from anybody else um, that they could possibly get um, angry with. This has actually worked for us before when we had residents who go in other people's rooms. And um, this person would not come out of somebody's bed, and this person wanted to go to bed. So we went in and told, you know, hey John, you've got a phone call. I do, and so this person was able to get up, and by the time they walked all the way around our our circle, he'd forgotten there was a phone call, we didn't bring it up again, and he was out of that room. Um, one of the things I would love to have is a phone that when anybody had to call, whoever they thought they had to call, it would automatically go to the same, the, the person on the other end, it would automatically go to the same person, and that person would be whoever they thought they should be. Does that make sense? I've gotten calls at home like that, and I've, I've asked them to call me, and I've pretended I was whoever they needed me to be at that moment in time when they made that phone call. Um, and it's kind of fun. All of this is like being on stage all day long. You're acting. Um, and if agitation persists, you got to go away and come back later. Because you just don't, they're, right now they're pretty angry with you, and you got to get out of their life. Um, if, need, if needed, we want to get help and another resident to take over. We play good cop, bad cop all the time. Sometimes you're the good cop and sometimes you're the bad cop. Unintentionally, just how it happens. Um, ask them for help. So if they're pretty angry or upset or something or not having a good day, you can always say, you know what, show me what you need to show me if you can't tell me. Or could you help me? We have people help uh, follow us around and empty the garbage and things like that. Or folding is probably one of the best things that anybody with um, dementia can do. That repetitive motion of folding is very helpful. Who cares what it looks like? We unfold towels so they can fold them. Again, um, ask them to show you if they can't verbally communicate. So show me what's going on. If you can't understand what they're saying. Sometimes they can show you what they want. And then we want to validate the feelings behind the words. So if somebody is having a really bad day, we kind of want to validate what are those feelings behind the word. If they're looking for their mom, or they're looking for their dad, or they're looking for their kids, you can always stop and say, tell me about your husband. And you got to have a little bit of background information, and you can pretend to be stupid and say, you know what, wasn't his name, was it George? You know, you got to play the game. And, and they'll say, no, no, no. It was Tom. Oh yeah, tell me about Tom. Or if you know, you can say, so wasn't his name Tom? And then, um, tell me about Tom. Did he ever bring you flowers? Did you ever go dancing? Did he ever make you dinner? Tell me about Tom. Because obviously, they're missing Tom. Um, so it's, it's validate those feelings of being uh, sad. Positive reinforcement always, always is a, a bonus. Someone comes back to the, from the beauty shop, or someone just got a new dress on, or even if it's not a new dress, and they look really good in that color, 
I mean, they, they have to be they have to be sincere and not flippant. But you know what? Wow, Trish, you look so good in purple. You look beautiful today. I mean, just those kind of comments will perk somebody's day up. Um, rescue and take the blame. Um, this worked for me the other day at Lydia's house. We had a, ra a resident. We needed we needed to get her into the restroom, and she wasn't having anything. It wasn't having anything of it. And I told her, I said. I think you sat in something and now your dress is wet and um, she said I did and she didn't just speak well and I said can I help you change this dress so we get into the restroom and she she's starting to feel she was well it's not wet and I said oh it's underneath it's underneath that let me help you let me help you and it, it was it was a process and it took some time and a lot of patience and I'm going really slow because you're not going to help me because we have a challenge with her. She doesn't want anybody to help her. Um, so anyway, we want to rescue and take the blame, even if we spilt the liquid on them. Um, and then what do you want the end result to be? The end result for me was getting her changed without aggression, without her biting and kicking and spitting on somebody, um, which is what I heard happen. But again, it's that approach. And what I did at the end was I thanked for a lot, her allowing me to help her. I said, thank you for letting me help you. And she said, thank you, which I was totally shocked. Mm -hmm. So again, it's, it's that constant knowing, um, knowing that person. So some nutritional interventions. So people who are you know, in the diet, having a different colored plate from the food. If you have a white plate, a white potato, white piece of fish, and white cauliflower, it all melds together. So having a different color plate, which we are mandated to do by the state at Liddy's House of having contrasting uh, things, it really makes a difference. Don't overload the table with stuff that sometimes um, less is better. I mean, a spoon, a fork, and a knife, and three or four glasses, a cup of coffee, all that stuff is what, I don't know what to use, and I don't know how to use it anymore. So a lot of times just one utensil and a plate or one utensil and a bowl and one glass, sometimes it's all they can handle. And we just have to be okay with that. Um, promote a pleasant, calm, and sociable and enjoyable meal time. We don't want a lot of rumbling and talking and noise. Uh, maintain, maintain stability of the environment. Seating, seating partners, time of day. Sometimes that routine really helps people. Uh, provide adequate adaptive de devices, like um, sometimes people need a special uh, curved spoon or fork or weighted utensils. Um, and to provide appropriate meals in terms of texture, food preferences, snacks, amounts, and supplements. Whatever they like. We had one lady once only ate Oreo cookies for six months. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. That's all she would eat. Oreo cookies. Oreo cookies. And it was like, wow, what are we going to do? But that is all she would eat. Um, and finally it got better, but it was, it was hard because that's, that was it. Um, residents sits where they will best be successful. And this can kind of be sad, and you got to think about, is it time for them to move? But we've had to put people facing a wall with their food because everybody else in this room would distract them and they couldn't eat because it was too distracting. They had to sit facing away from everybody so they could actually eat a full meal because it was too much, overwhelming. So then you, I don't know if you have any of that here, but then is it time to think about, uh, are they appropriate for here anymore? Provide the appropriate amount of assistance and supervision during meals without promoting too much dependence on staff. Monitor, observe intake. Consider the need for monitoring weight. That's kind of one way we track um, Alzheimer's, the disease process is by the weight. Um, always use dessert if that's all they're going to eat, like the Oreo cookies or ice cream. Um, provide various fluids over the course of the day and provide good oral care because the mouth pain will prohibit people from eating because their mouth hurts. Physical environment. Re re reduce the excess noise. Is the room too hot? Is the room too cold? More lighting is better because if there's a lot of shadowing and lighting, people misperceive what they see. The better the light, I mean, I know now the older I am, I have to have lots and lots of light in my sewing room because I need more light to see better. So our aging population needs even more light. Provide safety and security in their, in their place. Individuals their environment, like their own furniture, their own things. Increase personal space. Um, add things of comfort so that things that make people feel good. 
uh, comfortable chairs, recliners. We we had sofas and lounges and uh, things at Liddy's house and rockers and gliders. But the only ones that people really like are recliners, and they want their own. They don't want to share with anybody else. They want their own. They want their own space. Um, quiet space and change up as needed. Um, so some of the new stuff that's out there um, on research. One of the big things out there right now, these are some things I pulled up. Um, looking at, we're looking at the retina of the eye to do more, to find out, and it will help them to do an earlier diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. And what they were looking at is the thinner your retina is, the chances um, that you're going to get Alzheimer's disease increases. So that was a pretty interesting study. And if they can just do that by looking at your retina, that's pretty uh, amazing. And stress and brain shrinkage. The more stress you're under, the more higher your cortisol level is, the faster your brain can shrink. So you got to de-stress your life. Um, and there's a big link between chronic inflammation and a higher risk with the APOE4 gene. We all get an APOE4 gene or an APOE gene, one from our each parent. Um, if you have two APOE4 genes, your chance is greater to get Alzheimer's disease. But then again, if you have chronic inflammation in your body, your chances would go up even more. So something to consider that they're looking at. And then there was a new drug therapy out that reverses memory deficits and stops Alzheimer's disease pathology in animals. It hasn't yet been tried on humans, but it was proven non-toxic to humans. But they haven't tried it for this, this um, disease. And then gut health, which I'm going to pass this around. Um, you can just take a look and pass it on. It's about, it's a, we're all really into it right now, probiotics and things like that. Um, so kind of look at gut health and how it can affect your brain. It's really kind of interesting how your gut health has an impact on your brain um, and what a healthy gut looks like and normal behavior for cognition and abnormal gut function. function and alterations in behavior, cognition, emotion, and non-inception. Um, if your cells are inflamed. Um, anyway, a microbiome is the microbes in the gut that protect us against germs and break down food to release energy and produce vitamins. So if those micro, microbes are not doing their job, again, your gut is not health, uh, healthy. The lipids of the fats, the cholesterol, triglycerides are important parts of living cells that together with carbs and proteins are in the gut. All this stuff flows through our blood and our blood goes throughout our body. So healthy gut, healthy heart helps to make a healthy brain. So it was, just, it was a very interesting uh, piece of information. So what is one thing that you can do differently to help your residents? Just one thing. Change your approach. Be in their moment. Be in their moment. Learn more about them. Learn more about them. Yeah, the more you know. If you could learn a hundred, it's a hard thing, but if you could learn a hundred things about each resident, that's a lot. That's a lot. Um, so, what the answers to the, the quiz? <laughs> Number one, dementia is a chemical change in the brain. True. True. The person with dementia can change their thinking whenever they want. Approach is a is good customer service. True. Learning and understanding starts in the optic nerve of the brain. True. False. It's the hippocampus. True. Everything goes to the hippocampus through the eye, but it goes back to the hippocampus, that part of the brain, and then it goes into long-term memory. So is that true or false? False. 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 But what you see, but another thing though, what you see, what you see, what another research that they're looking at is what you see goes in your eye through the lens, through the retina, goes back to the optic nerve also, and people who have dementia cannot, there's, a, there's something that's broken in between and they can't distinguish what they even see because that, there's, a, there's a breakage there. Using different colored plates is one way to help folks eat independently. And one research study has focused on looking at the retina of your eyes. That's it. That's all I got. Ten to three. I'm not an hour for this.
So make sure you write down an hour. 